Stop, Mr. Gordon. Hey, what's up, guys? You wouldn't know when they normally do good news, would you? Hold, on a, early? Sec, hold on a second, because we're, we're streaming at the moment. Oh, okay. So let me in. Okay, I have the stream up and running, so if you can go to that live link, if you go to the, the GITV AV Tech channel, you should be able to see the live link, hopefully, and when you open up that link, or when you open up that, uh, that stream, you should be able to see the link, the YouTube link at the top. Okay, so you can hear me now. Okay, that's good because I want you to be my backup here. I'm going to do some mic checks. You don't see the video. You don't see the boardroom? No, are you kidding me? I see it fine. So you don't you don't see video at all. I see video and audio. Oh, all right, there it goes. I hit the, I did the refresh. Oh, okay. Gotcha. All right, so here. Okay, so you're gonna hear me in the video checking mics. I just want you to let me know if you can hear. This is the podium mic. One, two, three, one, two. This is microphone number six, microphone number six. Mic number five, mic number five. Mic number four, number four mic. Mic number three, mic number three.
Microphone number two. Microphone number two. And lastly, microphone number one. Microphone number one. Does this sound muffled to you, or is it just me hearing it through your speaker? Yeah, well, it's, it's... Okay, yeah, they normally don't speak that close into it anyway. So, so it's... So it's normally not an issue, but okay. So I'm gonna turn that off. You see me now, right? I'm walking across to the podium and now I'm heading toward the camera. Okay. Oh, gosh. Okay, alright, so I'm gonna mute the sound now.
Just so you know. Check, check, one, two, three. Check, check, one, two, three. I'd like to call the uh, budget meeting to order and begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. tonight for our proposed budget presentation, adopted budget presentation. Uh, so I want to thank you all if you're watching online or if you're here in person, we thank you. I know you've heard me talk about the mission of the Rhode Island Central School District and it's really important to talk about 
that mission in the context of our budget, uh, and it is to inspire all students to achieve their greatest potential by fostering academic excellence, personal growth, and social responsibility. Each year that we work as a governing body, we talk about the budget goals and developing a long-term sustainable budget designed to provide the best of diversified education program for all students, UPK through grade 12, to retain those uh, important community-mandated student programs and or activities, and of course to do everything we can uh, to have a uh, protection of our reserves and fund balance. So uh, in this budget, we have recommended to hire uh, an ENL teacher because of the increase in students who require English as a second language throughout the district. Uh, we have made a recommendation to hire a social worker, <coughs> a speech teacher, an elementary teacher, and to take our or uh, elementary orchestra and strings program and increase it from a 0.6 to a full-time uh, FTE, which is really an increase of 0.4 for elementary strings. Our athletic director, uh, we're asking for an increase, or we've adopted an increase in athletics for the salary to add on $5,000. Uh, we've increased the National Academy Foundation uh, Business Academy uh, program by $3,000 and this budget has a transfer to the food service debt from the general fund to the food service account of $8,000. And uh, throughout the budget development process, which uh, begins in January uh, here at the board meetings, we talk a lot about the needs and desires uh, throughout the district. You can see that there were other requests from the high school that we've moved to consider next year. That included an additional social worker, guidance counselor, special ed teacher, math teaching assistant, and uh, additional stipends for clubs. At the middle school, there were requests for additional help with speech and AIS math and AIS English and language arts, additional help with school counseling, uh, increases for clubs like the National Junior Honor Society and the French Club and the Environmental Club and those thoughts have been moved uh, to be reviewed for next year. And you can see, uh, whoops, throughout uh, the rest of the budget development, there were things that we were able to handle internally and things that we've asked uh, for the board to consider in the next year. And uh, with the overall operations, there were lots of requests. You can see everything from painting to furniture, uh, in increases in our weight room and uh, buildings and grounds. And as you can see, uh, a lot of those requests have been moved to the far right column, uh, but some things did make it through, like that increase in the National Academy of Finance. So at this point, I'd like to turn this portion of the presentation over to Dr. Harris. Okay, so the next item on here is uh, what is considered Proposition 2, and Prop 2 is our bus per purchase proposition. Um, so just uh, as you've seen at many other presentations, this is for four 65 passenger buses, one 29 passenger bus, and uh, two Ford F-350s. Um, I always like to make sure people know what budget cycle this actually impacts once it's approved. So the payments for these vehicles do not start occurring until the 2023-24 school year. Um, and also this is the practice that we've done for over 20 years. I know that there was a question, I think it was at the last budget presentation in reference to the ability to possibly take these funds and switch it to start doing the electric bus. Um, there are some stipulations in every proposition and one of the stipulations in the proposition for bus purchases is your time um, or length of borrowing. And the length of borrowing time is listed at five years, so I would not recommend um, purchasing an electric bus with a stipulation of paying that back in five years. Um, as expressed in the past, uh, there are some future meetings that are coming up, so as we learn more, we'll be sharing it with the board 
so we can plan that out properly as as well as know the longest amount of time that um, you can borrow to make it more feasible for the community and for the school district. Sorry, I'm looking at my laptop too. Um, the next item uh, that was included in the budget for the 2022-23 school year is the capital outlay um, project. This was actually something we were hoping was going to increase to 250,000. Uh, that did not happen uh, this year, but it's something that uh, Western New York, ASBO, ASBO, which is Association of School Business Officials for New York State, has been pushing for, and we do think it's going to change, especially uh, if the electric bus is going to be something that has to be carried out, because a larger amount would actually help people start piecemealing this together um, with infrastructure and things like that. So at least that's the angle that I've been pushing. Um, but this allows us to do uh, different smaller projects yearly, um, which also means that we're not doing large 40, 50 million dollar projects if you can start doing little things as you see they're needed. Um, the current project is, I believe it's at Cute, and it is with uh, the door access card, so that's something we're currently working through. And um, once this is approved, we will be sitting down to come up with a plan so we can get approval uh, by the state to move forward. This is just a summary of all of the major expenditure areas. Uh, this provides the budget to budget difference as well as the percentage uh, increase or decrease um, if that occurred. So clearly our biggest areas as always are salary and benefits. So you'll see the information there. Um, we did have retirements, um, so that has increased slightly to take that into consideration. And the debt service payment has reduced slightly um, as well. We are anticipating um, some possible special education placements, so we wanted to account for that. Um, myself and Cheryl Cardone work closely uh, to monitor that to make changes as necessary. Um, so that pretty much sums up all the major expenditures. This takes what is on the other page as just a summary and really breaks it down um, area by area. So in HR, you will see uh, the compensation change, FICA, health insurance, unemployment, retirement, and um, teacher retirement system uh, increases. And then everything thereafter goes into each either department, um, building, or subsection. Um, BOCES, you will see here, did not have that much of a change. Uh, if you remember, I think it's been now three years, uh, we approved for BOCES to do a capital project. So one of those payments have occurred each year that reduces slightly. So some of the increase has been um, eaten up by that actual decrease. Um, as already mentioned, special education uh, tuition, we anticipate some increases there, so that is taken under consideration. In the school buildings, it's really the uh, textbook add back. You'll see the note here that conference and travel was uh, removed, and that is actually going to be, they will still be able to do conferences and travel, but it will be under the American Rescue Plan. Um, which is allowable for teachers and staff to, to do conferences and professional development. Um, you have a couple of district-wide areas. There's not much change um, that's happening there. You have a lot of zeros. Okay, so uh, we put back in conference and travel uh, for the Board of Ed area slash superintendent. Um, now that Niskis is meeting, people seem to be doing a lot more uh, in person as of right now. Uh, so this allows for those things to occur. And I believe, I'm not sure where the uh, board's meeting will be for the upcoming year. Sometimes it's here, sometimes it's away. So this allows for board members to also um, attend those things. You will see here that there, it looks like the business office cut a lot of funds out of their budget. But um, that is really us just moving the textbook funds back into um, the buildings. 
uh, there was a slight add back for conference and travel, and then there is also a increase uh, through NICER for some insurance coverages taking place. Um, I think everything else, uh, debt service is just really a flip-flop of uh, we were paying a ban, and we are now um, converted that to a bond, so you'll see that in the debt service area. And here, because uh, the requests are not put in initially, um, you do see transfer to these areas as zero because they remained except for um, food service actually receiving an $8,000 increase, which is a separate uh, request. So this gives a summary of all of our revenue sources. Um, at the top, you will see the uh, real property tax levy, and that has increased or amount of change of $2,029,278, which is 5.59%. Um, that is the allowable uh, levy increase and does follow the uh, tax cap calculation um, requirements and um, information. Then you will see the state aid increase here, which is about $827,000. Um, building aid has slightly decreased. BOCES aid um, has decreased. That part of that decrease is also because we're not paying as much in reference to the capital project, so that component of the aid goes down as well. Um, in lieu of taxes is pilots. We have a pilot that is coming off of our component and going on the roll, so we have to take that into consideration because that's a little bit less revenue. And then um, our project that we just finished up, we were using um, some reserves from our debt for that project, and we are no longer doing that since it's completed. Ooh. All right, I'm going to turn this way a little bit. <laughs> I got to love the colors on this one. Um, so what this does here is it takes the tax cap calculation um, and it projects that out for multiple years. One thing that I do think is important to uh, note is this does not take into consideration electric buses. Um, I think in a future, probably within the next couple of months of a future presentation, we will work to figure those numbers out so we can uh, give an updated presentation of what that what those buses and the purchase of those buses need to the tax cap calculation. But this is just as uh, life currently stands, uh, taking into consideration our current debt, um, any capital projects, and uh, growth factors that are estimates. And that's why you see those two areas highlighted in green, because those could change. Um, the tax base growth factor and the allowable growth factor are not set by Grand Island. Um, tax base growth factors really the growth that's happening on the island and the allowable uh, growth factor is that 2% tax cap so it can never be more than 2% so I just factored in 2% it could be less than that though so as more information is known though that will be updated so this just shows a snapshot of um, what the tax uh, increases could be percentage wise and I think I'm going to to my slides because I think I can see a little bit more of the screen. Um, oh, um, so you will see for this year we do see the 5.59% which is primarily due to the fact that the um, debt reserve is no longer there and then it stabilizes a bit more and you see a 2.4, 2%, a 2.45, 2.52, so it does look to be stable, stabilizing. Um, clearly, all of this changes based on the factors that uh, go into the formula, and I do project a change with the bus component because it's going to be a hefty cost, um, but we'll know more, I guess, when the state tells us more. Okay, so with that 5.59%, actually means um, for taxpayers is we are estimating um, per thousand so um, per thousand seventeen dollars and ten cents so on a bless you um, this shows you what that looks like on an assessed valued home 
180,000, then you see the assessed value home if it includes star of 150,000. Um, one thing, and if you look at the bottom, you will see where we were in the 21-22 year when we talked about budget, as well as the 2020-21 um, school year when we talked about budget. And at the top, you will see where we actually landed. Um, so last year there was a reassessment that happened so that our projected amount of $20.41 actually came in to be $16.20. Um, and so the estimated change is now $0.91, cents, which brings you to $17.10. Okay, so I added um, this this year, it also went out in the budget book. I thought it provided a really nice snapshot of where we have been as a district over the last nine to 10 years. Um, so you will see for each year, you will see the projected tax rate and the actual tax rate. Um, so clearly the reassessment definitely brought the tax rate down but the proposal, even though it is 5.59%, when you look at it big picture, is actually still a lot less than what people have paid per thousand uh, for the last nine to 10 years. I didn't go further back than that because the, the rates were a little different because you didn't have a tax cap calculation. This provides the um, fund balance for our different uh, reserves that we currently have in place. Um, clearly right now, as of, or at least as of us having to complete this by March 31st, there was not much change from what happens June 30th. There usually is not. Um, when we finish up the school year, we go through the audit process and we also work with our financial advisors. They will assist us with setting limits um, what areas need to be funded possibly more, what areas you want to decrease um, if necessary, and then though that information and those dollar amounts will be brought and presented to the board in October for um, approval of not only the audit, but approval of our reserve loans. This just provides a really quick uh, recap or snapshot of all of the different revenue sources and it groups expenses in real really three areas salary benefits uh, debt service and other costs which leaves us with a total budget of seventy million two hundred six thousand six hundred and sixty eight dollars um, and there is a zero uh, difference so it's balanced just read that number. Um, the only thing I would say here, uh, we did ask to use an additional um, component of appropriated fund balance. Um, as expressed in the past, it will be a mission critical year, so we will be looking at uh, everything that's being requested, um, reducing expenses where we're able to and monitoring as we usually do, um, and then just presenting that information to the board, which also means presenting it to the community. We added in uh, the slide in reference to a contingency budget and just making sure people understand that when this occurs, um, we cannot levy more than what was levied in the prior year. So that entire $2,029,278 has to be removed. Um, I think it's important to notice, to note that People are, most people understand that capital and equipment has to come out of the budget because that is a component under a contingent budget. Um, I think it's important to show how much in our budget is actually capital and equipment. So that's only 244,000. So every dollar beyond that really is impacting the students, right? You're, if, if you have to remove $1.7 million additional um, you are looking at impacting class sizes, staffing, non-mandated programs, athletics, and extracurriculars. So I just, I, I went to something a couple of days ago and it really highlighted helping people understand it. Because, you know, when you look at millions of dollars, they're like, what's a million out the budget? But that's really what it looks like um, and how it impacts students. 
is at this time for members that, of the community that are present. If you have any questions or comments, uh, this would be the appropriate time to share that with us. Jim? Yeah. On this capital account, this 100000 that you started last year, the items in that look like repair and maintenance. I mean, ongoing, fix this, fix that type of thing. Now, was this account created to move stuff out from under the 2% cap to move it into this capital area so it now doesn't, is it, you know, constrained by the 2%? I mean, what did we do? Two years ago with these type of items. Okay. Yeah. I just want to make sure I was I'll start and I'll pass okay. it. A couple years ago when the budget was tight, we didn't do the one hundred thousand dollar capital outlay. Oh, I, I know you didn't have that account. But these type of items yeah. were they done two years ago? So this year we're putting um, No, two years ago, Brian. These type of, of activities presumably were done. You had repair and maintenance. Were they done? And now are those type of things being moved into this account? So Jim, when you say two years ago, are you talking about the capital project that we approved? The big one? No, with, with I'm the, talking about the type of stuff that's in this $100,000 that you did not. Small items little things that you added up to $100,000. They look like repair and maintenance, ongoing things that really don't look like what I would call a capital item. I would call those repair and maintenance, and it would seem to me that they would fall under this 2% uh, thing. So have they been redefined to be moved out? So two things, capital outlay project is part of the tax cap calculation. It's, it's part of the actual calculation that goes in for um, your debt service as well as your state aid. So there's a component of that, you don't see it broken out, but it has to be included in that calculation. The second item in reference to whether this looks like repairs that the district can just make, if there are small items that are broken and be can be repaired and it's fifteen thousand dollars do we do that repair yes capital outlay also follows the exact same process that any capital project follows so for us to get approved we have to submit our documentation to the state and the state has to deem it a capital outlay project and ruby that's funded um 75 cents on the dollar is that yes. it is so we're reimbursed for capital outlay projects every year um, of the hundred thousand about seventy five thousand is yes. given back to the district by the state and then we're paying about twenty five thousand twenty four thousand. So that's my next question. Okay. Let's take a look at this account, the T account. And July first last year you credited with a hundred thousand bucks. Over the course of the year, you spent a hundred thousand. You turned in those invoices to the state. They sent you seventy-five thousand dollars back. Okay, so you credited the account on say June thirtieth with seventy-five thousand. So at the end of the fiscal year, we have seventy-five thousand dollars. Okay, come July one, what what's going to happen? Are we going to top that off with twenty-five thousand dollars? Or are we adding a new hundred thousand bucks so we'll have a hundred and seventy-five thousand in this account? Because there's a real difference on the dynamics of how this evolves over time. You'll have a hundred and seventy-five thousand, which they are gonna get uh, three quarters back, so that'll be a hundred and twenty-seven something. And next year you'll get a hundred thousand on top of that, so it'll be over two hundred thousand in this account. You see where I'm going with this? Think it can blow up. If it isn't, we're just replenishing it with the 25,000 each year. So on the, um, on the, as you use T account, I'm just going to use a capital outlay fund okay. account. Um, you're allowed to put at max 
the hundred thousand dollars the state that's an expense area the state is going to send you revenue in the following year they don't it's not the same year you have to do the project the project has to be completed and submitted um, with documentation by June 30th and then we submit information in our st3 so you never get it the same year the project's happening and then once the auditors our auditors who come in any dollar that has not been spent or is deemed to be extra then funnels back into all of the general fund expenses so it's not an account that is building and the capital outlay request is not a request that is compiling on top of each other it's just saying each year we want permission to be able to do the project and it's a requirement of the state that we make it very transparent to voters that we're okay. continuing it so we get the money back on june 30th we got it back august 15th okay mm -hmm. when do we know that that money's coming we, we don't know until the state approves that they deem our project to be acceptable and everything to be completed. Somehow or another, there's a potential for the district to wind up with $75,000 of cash slash and which it, it looks okay. okay, but okay, I see what it is. Now I have couple of other comments. Um, the reason the tax rate looks like it's come down a little we were reassessed. There was a huge reassessed valuation here. The number that should be looked at is the total taxes that a uh, property assessed at 150 or 200,000 bucks paid each year rate and base can fluctuate all over the place. The only thing that matters is the dollar amount. Um, finally, and I got questioned by this by a number of people, they want to know why, again, on Proposition 2, not listing the specific vehicle. I mean, just like last year, it's very amorphous. You can buy Ferraris the way this thing is um, And I'm hearing from people, why don't they put it in? It used to be that they told us exactly what we were buying. And we, we know we had the information thing, because I've seen it in the uh, uh, PowerPoints uh, a month ago. So, you know, what's so hard about putting that in? So we follow the legal language that is provided to us. But one thing based on some of the feedback that was given last year that we did change is in the mailer that goes home, that is a four-page document, it lists the items that compile Prop 2. But that's not Prop 2, unfortunately. Prop 2 is this. And what it says is what you can do. And even that, in 99, we had a capital budget, and we were told that we were getting new science labs. And we didn't. We got a third gym. The, you know, poof. The thing is, the, this proposition is very amorphously worded. It allows us lots of discretion. Years ago, it was very explicit with my four 65 seat buses, 129, two F-250s or 350s. Exactly what we did. Why did they come away? I just don't understand what was so difficult about that. I just can assure you that's what we're going to buy. <laughs> so thank you, Jen. Okay. Thank you so much. Any other comments from the people in attendance today? We appreciate your interest in our district. At this time, if it's okay with the board, we'll transition to our board meeting. All right, uh, we will begin our uh, regular meeting. Yeah, we'll allow everyone in. And, yeah. Okay. <laughs> 
uh, the junior class. The senior prom will be located at the Double Tree in Niagara Falls on June 11. The senior class is very excited. Um, they're bringing back our well-known post-prom party this year, and this will be here in the Viking Mall. The after-prom party is sure to become one of the biggest events of the senior year experience, and this will take place on Saturday, June 11, from 10.30 p.m. to 2.30 a.m. We want to, of course, thank all the local business and families of Grand Island for making generous donations to help run this event. And the Pro Palm community, Committee will place an insert in the 2022 graduation pamphlet and display all the names and businesses that have donated and helped run this wonderful event. And finally, our final uh, bullet here is the PTSA will be sponsoring the Academic Awards Ceremony in the high school on May 20th. And Mr. Gorton will be live streaming the event for families and friends to view. That way we can all um, take part in the award ceremony. Thank you very much. Nice job, Thank man. Thank you. Okay, that brings us to our correspondence recognition and good news with uh, our athletic director, John Roth, for our winter sports season recap. Yep. Gotta get close to it, John. <laughs> Thank you for allowing me to uh, give you a recap of the winter season. Um, we've had a lot of many, I should say, ups and downs, masks on, masks off, uh, COVID daily during the winter season, COVID during the week, and a lot of wins and losses. But uh, through all this, we had three championship teams and a lot of individuals that had personal bests. So at this time, what I'd like to do is uh, invite uh, my indoor winner track coach up here just to honor some of her individuals and some of the individuals that went to the state tournament. <laughs> Hello everybody, my name is Michelle White, I am the um, indoor track and field coach. I uh, just want to say first of all, thank you for allowing me to brag to you tonight. Uh, while we are knee deep in our outdoor track season, I'd like to reminisce for a quick second and talk about our indoor track season. Our biggest opponent this year happened to be the weather. Uh, some meets had to be canceled for us and uh, did keep us away from some pretty big and important meets, but in the end, our athletes competed hard. Four school records were broken in a short amount of time. Uh, the 1,000 meter record uh, is now, now belongs to Faith Caldwell. The 3,000 meter record for the indoor um, season also belongs to Faith Caldwell. Um, the 55 hurdle record belongs to our very own Becca Schultz. And she's also a member of the 4x2 um, record holders that include Noelle Linnenfelter, Haley Martinez, Becca, and Avery Mondew. Um, two athletes, the two athletes standing to my left, did extend their season by qualifying for the state championship down in Ocean Breeze, New Jersey, um, back in February. Becca competed in the 55 hurdles, and Mikey competed in the weight throw. Um, it was quite an eye-opening experience for both of them, and I'm going to donate the next 30 seconds, Mikey, 30 seconds, <laughs> to Mike. Um, he just wanted to give a brief, quick overview of what states, going to states meant to him and Becca. <laughs> Uh, overall, I'm just uh, thank you for the experience. Uh, very rewarding. Uh, got to be in a world-class facility and uh, just great competitors. Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, for those of you that have never been down to Ocean Breeze, it's a beautiful facility right on the water. Uh, you literally are on the shore of, geez, I don't know, Long Island Sound. I don't know, one of those waters down there. Um, but ultimately the biggest reward I think for all of us is to watch uh, this indoor and outdoor team um, grow immensely. We doubled in size um, for indoor and almost tripled in size for outdoor. Um, so I think that might be our biggest accomplishment for me anyway. We are graduating over 20 seniors this year. Uh, as, my, as Riz let you guys know earlier, our senior night is tomorrow. 
Um, I heard it's going to be beautiful outside, so please come and help us say goodbye to these seniors as they take one last trip around the Oval. Thank you for having us today. tonight because he's working but I just had to uh, say a few words about our wrestler Brian Bielek. Uh, Brian in six year, varsity years, seventh grade on, went to the states four times. Uh, he is our all-time leading or Grand Island uh, winner as far as uh, career wins and he had 198 but when you think about last year he probably lost about 30 matches, which Brian probably would have won all of them. So he could have been 225 uh, wins, but he had 198 wins. Um, he also well, he also uh, had 46 consecutive wins this year, which is unbelievable. It's got to be a school record, but I'm not sure yet. And uh, he, he he also um, started. In seventh grade and eighth grade, he was a 99 pound. In eighth grade, he went to the States. Ninth grade, he moved up to 126, went to the States. Tenth grade, he jumped from 126 to 160. And in wrestling, if you understand that, you're not supposed to win when you gain that much weight. And he still made it to the States. And uh, the reason he gained all that weight is obviously he's an all-league football player and a fullback. And, uh, you know, led us to the division championship uh, also in football. But, I, you know, I had to say a few things about Brian. Uh, he's arguably, and maybe not arguably, the greatest wrestler we've ever had here at Grand Island. Uh, this year he finished fifth in the States. He had a pretty tough draw. Um, he was honored, uh, oh, it was a couple months ago, by the Niagara Falls PAL, Police Athletic League, um, as athlete, athlete of the PAL, and that is, he's competing against 15 high schools. So, most of them from uh, Niagara County. So, that's a feather in his cap. He also won, and it, this has never happened, the comeback player of the year where you were injured, and then you come back and wrestle the next year. He had a knee injury, he rehabbed, and uh, it just goes to show you what kind of person he is. He's been, uh, Recruited by Division One schools, West Virginia, UB, Edinburgh, Clarion. Uh, those schools are actually Division One in wrestling. But uh, he chose to stay a little closer to home, and he's going to Oswego State. So I just wanted to congratulate uh, Brian Bielek. I know he couldn't be here, but uh, he deserved this. Thank you. Brian's there with his mom. Or Brian is there it. with his I mom. Yeah. <laughs> Angela, his biggest supporter. Um, now, which was a, a big surprise for me, is uh, we have the next three honors for our three teams. Our girls hockey, we have boys hockey, and we have the boys both. So, to go first, I'll start with the team that went the farthest, and that is the girls hockey team. Uh, they went all the way to the state for, uh, final four. And uh, at this time, I had a little something I was going to uh, say, but I would rather have Matt Miller, assistant coach uh, over at Kenmore, um, come up here and speak on behalf of the girls' hockey team. We have about four girls here. So come on up, ladies. You can stand right over here. Yeah, stand right in front. We have uh, Molly Leggett, my MVP, the senior captain who arranged the buses for me and when we <laughs> needed a bus and when we didn't need a bus and the time and everything and she coordinated with all these girls. Way down is Tegan uh, Willits and we got Isabella uh, Burt and we have Bella Jamie and these are all Eighth grader, ninth grader, ninth grader, and we had nine girls. And as you know, 
before my head starts. We are combined with Kenmore East, Kenmore West, and Grand Island. And everybody kind of has a name, right? Are we K-E-N-G-I, is that what we are? Kenji. Yeah. You know, like Cash, uh, Clarence, Amherst, Sweet Home, Lid, what is it, Lancaster, Iroquois, Depew. So, I mean, everybody has this uh, nickname, but these girls are going to be back next year. And they won the uh, uh, Section 6 uh, Section six Championship. So, Matt, you're on it. Thank you. All right. Um, so, uh, head coach Orlowski couldn't make it tonight because he is, uh, you know, he's a busy man these days. But uh, we, we wanted to be here in person to thank uh, everybody for, for the support and just to celebrate the season and the success that the girls had. Uh, but to celebrate this season, we have to back up to last season. Uh, last year was a bit of a roller coaster. We didn't even know if we were going to have a season with COVID. And then once, you know, delayed season and short season, everything got going. It took us till the very last regular season game to get our first win, and it came in overtime, so we almost didn't get it. And then two days later, immediately eliminated from the playoffs. So last place, unsuccessful season but, uh, as far as standings go, but we, we still felt we had a lot of growth in uh, team chemistry. Uh, but we didn't really know what we were going to get this year. We didn't graduate too many players, so we thought it would be kind of similar, hopefully a little better as the girls get older. Um, we started 2-2-1 two, two, and one this year. And then we went up to Lockport to play in a, a local tournament, tied the first game, and that was the start to the program's longest ever unbeaten streak. Um, we tied and then won the next 10 games for the longest ever win streak as well. Um, lost a game and then came right back, won a few more. Uh, and that took us through, we won that, that tournament, the Western New York Girls uh, Winter Showcase Tournament up in Lockport. We traveled out of town and won the uh, North Country Shootout, uh, won that tournament as well and then just kind of kept the momentum rolling uh, all the way through the section tournament and defeated Williamsville 4-3, to is that right? 4-3, to um, and Williamsville is always a powerhouse, so to beat them was uh, you know, just such a great experience for the girls. And um, we, we all went all the way to uh, the state semifinals and lost to the eventual state championship team, uh, Skinny Atlas, who was just old and very good. And you know, we, sometimes you run into a buzzsaw and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, but, you know, I've coached uh, Tier 1 trial hockey for 10 years. I've coached this team for, this is 11th or 12th years, how many years we've been doing this. Um, and lacrosse teams, it's the most fun team I've ever been around, and it's all up to the girls here, especially our senior captain. So Molly is one of them. And uh, Kirsa Bouye was our other senior captain from Kemmer West. And these two girls especially, but the team in general, was just amazing at pulling everybody in and making sure everybody was involved. And they had fun in everything they did, practice, just hanging out at the rink, going home, having team dinners, whatever they did. It was, it was just an amazing group to be around. And every girl ended up um, you know, building each other up and cheering on the team so that they played together. One of the most cohesive teams I've ever coached, and it's like 30-some teams. So it was just amazing. And then you know, some individual play as well. Um, Bella Jamie set the uh, program record for a single season with 36 points in a single year. She's just a ninth grader. so. No pressure, but we have big expectations for next year. Um, Bella and uh, senior captain Kirsa Bouye were voted second team All-Stars. Uh, our goalie, Carolyn Bourgeau, and junior defenseman Megan Pinzel were voted to third team All-Star. And uh, you know, with the story of from, from worst to first, Coach Arlowski was voted the coach of the year, but he'd be the first one to say, you know, we don't do anything as a staff out there. We're just we put the girls on the ice and hope that they that they do the work and they, they did everything this year. So it was an amazing team. And uh, even though we fell two games short of our, our ultimate goal, um, like Mr. Roth said, we have almost the entire team back, minus a few, you know, some big losses, but we hope some girls can step up and we hope to be back in the exact same spot next year with hopefully a couple more wins. So I want to thank everyone for your support and thanks for our recognition here. Mr. Roth, I have a question. If, yes. uh, when they win the state championship one day, will it be a Grand Island state championship, a Kenmore state championship? Well, Do we share the trophy? Does each school get a trophy, or how does that work? We're going to, each school is going to get a trophy. And okay. a plant, and uh, probably they will give them the tour over the bridge like we did with the boys' volleyball team. Yeah. Kenmore we'll experience yeah. that. I'm looking forward to that. Sounds like Absolutely. we have a nice young team. And oh. A lot of hope for the future and 
uh, good luck at Steve's next year. It's three young girls. And, you know, yeah. did a lot. And of course, uh, Molly just held the whole team together. She really did. She did a great job. Uh, next up, um, I'm going to say a little few words about our new head coach, Bob Simpson, and Ryan uh, Donnelly, the assistant coach. Uh, this was Bob's first time as head coach because Don Frey has done it for the last 11 years, I think it is. Uh, Bob came, I mean, he comes up, and he ran a, what did you run last year, the offense or the defense? Offense. Offense still. And uh, he did an unbelievable job this year. Just the same old, same old, just like Don Frey does it without any glitches or anything else. And in the last five of six years. We have won the division, and this year we won the division again, so Bob just keeps it rolling. Um, incidentally, mentioning Don Prey, one thing they didn't say tonight, uh, we did win the tennis championship undefeated, uh, and uh, we beat Blue Port, who had one loss our, that we gave them. Uh, we beat them three to two today. So we are the NFL champs for boys tennis. So congratulations, and Bob, come on up. All right. Uh, first off, I just want to congratulate Coach Miller and the Canton girls as well, Ken G girls. Um, I have a little four-year-old girl that's playing hockey as well, and I live in Kemmer East Territory, so one day I think it'd be really special for her to play for Ken G. Um, if you check my Instagram, she's already at that level, so <laughs> push her. Um, as Mr. Roth, Mr. Roth said, we uh, finished. We started our season, uh, you know, on a little bit of a awkwardness here with COVID. We didn't know what it was going to look like, um, but ultimately we were able to play every single game. Um, we were able to get in the locker room. We had a little bit of normalcy there. We uh, finished off the year ten to two in our division. We won the division championship, the NFL championship. It's the first year we actually had like an NFL championship in hockey. We played all the normal teams. Uh, we were twelve and four overall in the league there. Our playoff journey was great as well. We won 8-0 uh, versus any team in the pre-quarters, 3-2 versus Frontier with a double overtime uh, goal by Jack Mankowski. Jack is here. Actually, we get a shout out. Idris, Valletta, Jack Mankowski, Joe Geyer, and Cole Barlotta are all here, but they got, they never came in, they're in the uh, overfull room, so. Uh, it's hockey guys, I, I don't know what to tell you. Um, but Jack uh, did put that puck in the net right there. Um, for a 3-2 uh, double overtime win. Um, our semifinal win was amazing as well. I know Dr. Graham was in attendance, I don't know if anyone else was, but we scored three goals in the last two minutes and 30 seconds for a 5-4 win over uh, Hamburg, which was an excellent team. And Idris Valletta, who is next door, uh, you know, scored two of those uh, three goals. Um, unfortunately, our season came to an end with a 2-1 loss versus start point. Um, Star Point eventually made it all the way to the state finals and they lost in overtime. So Star Point um, was an excellent team. Um, we really had a, a good game plan going in. Um, we were up 1-0 going to the third, but uh, unfortunately we left two goals in the third year. Um, I know uh, Mr. Roth mentioned Coach Donnelly. Um, coach Donnelly and Coach Leone, Anthony Leone's our volunteer assistant coach. He ran the offense this year. I always made the joke like I was like Ted Lasso, just kind of stood in the middle, didn't do much. Um, because Coach Donnelly and Coach Leon really just ran everything for us. So, uh, you know, I can't say enough about the reason why we were so successful is because of those two gentlemen um, right there. Coach Donnelly running the offense, or pardon me, defense, and Coach Leon running the offense. Well, uh, just some individual honors. We had two first team All-West New York players. Um, Liam Snyder was first team as a forward. He had 46 points, which was third in all of West New York, and that's all Catholics, large schools, and small schools. And Peyton Abbott was the only non-senior, um, a defenseman who just came from um, Kenmore West, actually, uh, transferred over, and he's a sophomore defenseman, and he was first team all year for defense. We had a first team on NFL, which was Eddie Korzak. He had 41 points, which was the highest point getter for an 11th grader, and a very special award, the uh, Mel Miguel Rodriguez Award. Um, for those that aren't familiar with Miguel Rodriguez, he was a Buffalo News beat reporter who just passed away from COVID this past winter. Um, and they had a, uh, an award in his honor for the first time ever. He was a goaltender back in the day. So the best uh, performance in the playoffs as a goaltender. And Evan Smith, even though we had the 2-1 loss, he, he won that award. Uh, he truly was one of the reasons why we made it that far. So overall, great season. 
looking forward to, uh, to next year, and we appreciate everything you guys do for us. Thank you. Good job, Mr. Simpson. <laughs> Mr. Simpson, just if, if you want to grab some of the boys and circle back here, we'll get a quick picture. All right, you got it. With you in the place. Thank you. It was probably the most exciting winter on ice we have had in a long time. The girls and the boys, it was just exciting. And uh, a lot of you sitting around here on the board and Dr. Graham uh, witnessed the, uh, the playoffs and the sectionals and uh, just so exciting. Should we wait or do you want me to? No, go ahead. Okay. Uh, boys bowling, that's our last team, our third team, but of course, we say the best for last, right? Yeah. So uh, the boys bowling team, coached by Craig Davis, really had an excellent team this year. But in the Niagara Frontier League, it's difficult. It's tough. We were seven and five. We finished third in the Niagara Frontier League. But as surprises are, come on, guys. Uh, surprise. I was surprised, other people were surprised, but I don't think the team was surprised or the coach by winning the Section 6 Class B Championship. Now there's only two, uh, you know, there's large schools and small schools, and you're just against, you know, a good 30, 35 other uh, uh, opponents or schools, and we ended up um, you know, winning the Section 6 Championship. and. Uh, Stand up, Cal. Cal is one of our uh, bowlers. Uh, the other up here, Cal Neeson. And then we got Josh McMahon, both seniors, right? Yeah. Okay. And uh, Talon Newton, Brandon Gross, Alex Sanford, Nick Galligan, and Josh Korn, who's an eighth grader. That made up our top seven right there. And these are the guys that won the bowling. And it's only the second time in Grand Island history for a Section 6 Class B championship. So, congratulations. Congratulations. And thank you again for all of you. Mr. Simpson, if you want to just want to stand with the boys, we'll get a quick picture. Congratulations. have our high school wind ensemble, concert band, chamber orchestra, and orchestra um, levels of distinction from the NISMA Festival. Uh, the, sure. the Grand Island Wind Ensemble received a rating of gold with distinction at level six from NISMA Festival um, with band director John Reed. And then the high school concert band received a rating of gold at level four from NISMA from the NISMA Festival, again with their band director, John Reed. And the Grand Island High School Orchestra received a rating of gold at level three from the NISMA Festival with orchestra director, Matt Owls. And the High School Chamber Orchestra received a rating of gold at level three from the NISMA, Fe uh, NISMA Festival with uh, director Matt Owls as well. Great. Megan, would you like to share a few words? Absolutely. Um, good evening, everybody. My name is Megan Lavis. I see a few familiar faces out here, so it's always nice to see you guys again. Um, so I just want to explain to you guys a little bit on what NISMA is exactly from a student perspective. Um, so they talk about NISMA being a competition and everything, but for us it's really a growing and a learning opportunity as musicians, and not only students, but really diving into that musician mindset. Um, so we all started playing when we were in fourth grade. And then we teamed up with Mr. Ells and, as sixth graders, and we started our NISMA journey as ninth graders. 
Unfortunately, COVID took us out 10th and 11th grade, but then as seniors, we came back and we, I got the opportunity to compete twice, once with the regular orchestra and then again with our chamber orchestra, who's all right here behind me, these lovely people. Um, but for us, it was a really great opportunity to be able to play in front of two different judges, one from an orchestra perspective, the other from a band perspective, and they recorded messages um, with our playing in the background, telling us things that we should work on, things that we need to grow on, and when they talk about it in competition, it's not exactly we rank against other schools in first, second, or third place. Um, gold and gold distinction are two very high honors that we were very fortunate to get, and we were so lucky to have the opportunity be, to be able to go and do this. Um, and so for us, it was a very good opportunity to listen to that feedback, and now we know exactly what we have to work on for our final concert coming up this May. Um, so we're very, very excited about it, and I just wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about it today, and hopefully it kind of opened up your perspective a little bit as to what that competition necessarily is. And yeah, I'm very, very excited to have them explain it a little bit more, but thank you. Thanks, nice job, Megan. <laughs> Uh, first, first and foremost, uh, thank you so much to Dr. Graham and the school board, uh, the, the campus administration, the community uh, for supporting music in the schools uh, through this COVID era. And um, as I was thinking about uh, where we've been since the start of last year, it's hard to remember that band students and uh, the choir students were 12 feet apart, uh, wearing masks in the choir, and we were wearing, wearing masks over our instruments in, in the band room. And then our orchestra students started uh, six feet apart last year. So to have gone from uh, those kind of rehearsals and classes, uh, and I forgot the over the uh, internet lessons, which were beyond difficult, but they all agree. Um, and some, you know, some of the parents, it can be a testament to that, and the, the internet streaming issues and everything. So to have gone from those kind of rehearsals and classes and experiences to what the kids got to share with. Uh, these adjudicators, these judges on Thursday, April 28th is just incredible. Uh, it's, it's almost a shame you, you would not have been able to tell that a pandemic happened to our students and that we had experienced that as a community. And that, that is a testament to the students in the school and the community and the way that Grand Island kids operate. So, uh, you know, I want to thank the students, the school board, uh, Dr. Grant, and everybody once again. Uh, it's truly a special place. Um, and one of the other things that we, we didn't tell the students going into this is that not a lot of schools are going and participating in this process right now because it's so difficult. So uh, we were really one of two high school orchestras and bands uh, that day uh, to even go and participate in an early contest, uh, and which is really difficult to get kids ready. Um, so they, they really rose to the occasion and we couldn't be more proud of their performances uh, that they did that day. So uh, just two things to wrap up. One, I want to give a big shout out to transportation. Um, they pulled off a blessing miracle, and the fact that they're keeping this whole school moving forward this spring, like, kudos to them. So, um, And also, the choir is heading to um, competition in the next couple of weeks, so you guys hopefully just have another uh, golden gold distinction to be celebrating at that time. So we're looking forward to this um, racking up another uh, medal. So thank you again for your support. Can we bring the students up and have the board stand with them? That'd be wonderful.
about what we do in the fall we do a show called Tales for Tots and during that production time our seniors write their own Tales for Tots based on stories and then our seniors cast them and direct them and usually our shows are geared for ages 3 to about 10 and they do a number of performances of that and then this year we traveled to Sidway to do the shows there as well. So one reason we do this is the middle school has their musical, usually the end of October, early November, that we only have two weeks in the auditorium till we can get our shows on. So that's why we do Tales for Tots in the fall. Then after the musical is over, we start our spring season and usually it's a play that I may get from a catalog or from something that's already been written, but for three years now, not necessarily all in order, Sam Summer wrote his own show. Then Sarah Gorton, Mr. Gorton's daughter, wrote her own show, and both of them directed their own. And then Leah said to me this year, Leah Harper, my president, said she would like to direct and write her own show. So in a minute, I'll call Leah up to talk about her show. But I'd like first to recognize the seniors that were part of the show. So unfortunately, our Sophia Bobek, who was wonderful, isn't here tonight because I know she's working. I know that Rebecca Thompson is home studying for the physics region, so that's why she's not here tonight. And then we have with us Faith Marcella. Faith designed a number of the sets and de designed the paint and also designed our t-shirts and the program covers, so we were very proud of her. Then we have John Paul Sabluski, and I know Maya Nowak is here somewhere. I don't know, she maybe went out with because she's in the concert orchestra as well. So then I also have here, I believe that's everybody, so I'd like to have Leah come up and talk for a minute about her experience as a director and writer. So Leah. Thank you, Mrs. Kennedy. Hi, I'm Leah Harper. I am writer and director of our show, The Runaways, and also president of Spotlighters. Um, the Runaways is a story of the sun and the moon. Um, they're like basically the narrators of the story, and they tell the story of a young princess of the kingdom of Thora, and a young man named Peter who fall in love. Um, and as the sun and the moon tell the story, they seem to have some relationship and love troubles of their own and those issues start to affect the story between the young princess and the young man um and i would really just love to thank beautiful mrs kennedy for everything that she has done for this production because i absolutely could not have done it without her and i would also th like to thank mr gordon in the back because he again i could not do it without them i would like to thank faith who um really I would, I would, I'd even call her like my co-director because she helped with anything that I needed during the show. She painted all of the sets. I stood in the back and was like, is there anything I can help you because I'm not super artistically talented. <laughs> um, and she, I told her exactly what I wanted, the t-shirts, and like that she got it all done for me. It was the vision. And I would like to thank all of my cast and crew for the show, for everything they have done for me. It couldn't have been... A, a better cast, and I couldn't have done it with all of, without all of them. Um, thank you. That's wonderful. Congratulations. I would just like to add that we had over 30 members. I know that if you were at the show, you saw how huge the cast was with the cast and crew on stage. When we tried to take cast pictures and then cast and crew on this full closing night, we were all around the stage. We hardly had room. So we were very, very proud of everything they did. 
So congratulations to all of you. Thank you. And thank you all for Maggie, our support. Maggie, can you bring the kids just right up here? We'll do a quick, sure. quick group picture. Yeah, just right, right up here. Public comment session, agenda items only. We did not have anyone sign up for that. And so we'll move on to curriculum and instruction with Mr. Loria. Thank you, Ashley, and good evening, everyone. Um, I do have four items. One is for action, so I'm going to start with that first. Um, we just have some overnight field trips that we're asking for board approval on, um, which is nice to see that we're going back to some of our uh, authentic learning experiences. One, there are actually two trips here to Disney World. One of them is our concert, um, our choir department, which will be traveling to the Singing World at the Epcot Center from December 10th through December 13th, um, 2022, upon your approval at Epcot Center, as I said. Um, the NAP Academy is also looking for the Academy of Finance to participate in Disney Imagination Campus Training, which is a leadership program for them, and that is from January 12th through January 16th, 2023. And the other approvals for Veronica County Middle School, which is a Quebec City trip for the French, one of the French two students, and I fortunately had a chance to ship a Quebec City trip of my own with a French club one day, and I can tell you that there's a lot to see in immersing yourself in the French language in Quebec City. Um, the students will be participating in a walking tour of the city, visiting St. Anne's, St. Anne's Cathedral, a sugar shack, and I know there's a lot of winter activities there as well. So I'm asking for board action, please, if you're willing to give it on this item for a motion to approve. I'll motion. Any second? I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any objections? Any extensions? Motion carried 6 0. Or 5 0. I'm not sure. I do know that I was actually kind of trying to figure that out. Yeah, I, I Cryptically, too, because they had. Uh, eight, they have a, we have a ratio of about eight chaperones per student, and they're sending, you know, they're, they're looking to send at least four chaperones, so I'm thinking that is approximately about 30 kids. So I'm not sure if it's tied to the academy and the kids participate in the academy. I would imagine that they would probably have the first option to go, and then they, they open it up to other students. It, so does, it does look like it's an academy trip. Um, for Informational, I just have an update on our last week of school calendar. Um, and this is to share with parents in the community. Um, the last week of school this year for students will be the week of June 20th through June 24th. Um, June 20th is actually a holiday with the Juneteenth holiday, so there will be no exams given on that day and no student attendance. June 21st on Tuesday will be a full instructional day for all students um, from K, well, I guess pre-K through eight. Um, and June 22nd will be a half, half day of instruction for students, and then June 23rd, which will also be a student last day. So June 23rd, there will be no students. Um, I do want to give the caveat for high school that all high school students that week will be reporting for their exams, the Regents exams that they need to take. And I do know there is a Regents exam on June 23rd, um, that last final day. So um, our teacher's last day of attendance will be June 24th. Um, for item C, I think that that is just my typical monthly report for the month of April. So please take a look at what's going on in our various committees and our staff development opportunities for teachers, as well as some of the things we're planning for for the future. And then finally, um, I just want to highlight um, on April 25th, we had an All Island PTA meeting, and at that PTA meeting, we got a chance to highlight a project that our district has been associated with for many years, which is over, over a decade, which is Dr. Leslie Morris' book project. 
Um, Dr. Sharon Kramer was in attendance. I included just a couple of pictures from that night. I know a couple of you were there, um, in which we had a book display of one uh, many of the books that were purchased with her donations this year. Um, th this year, the middle school was highlighted. And every year, Dr. Kramer, in honor of her late husband, Dr. Morris, gives a $500 donation to one of our buildings. Um, she has presented at the board meeting before. Many of you may have been here and remember her doing that. This year, we decided that we wanted to present to the parents to kind of see what their what their students are getting out of this. And some of the things that were presented were not only the books, but the work of some of our students, the projects of some of our students, podcasts from some of our students. So we just want to thank Dr. Kramer for her generous donation. And I'm glad that um, I had a chance to kind of just let everyone know um, some of the good things going on in the schools. And next year, she'll be focusing on our high school. And that's it for curriculum, unless there's questions. Thank you. Okay, moving on to personnel instructional. Um, if I could have a motion to approve PI1 to PI3, please. And a second. All in favor? Aye. Any objections? Any abstentions? Motion carried 6 0. Do we have any introductions tonight? I would um, like to mention that Dr. Ruby Harris is listed <clears throat> on the agenda, and the board just uh, granted the future uh, appointment of tenure. So we'll talk more about Dr. Harris and all of our tenure candidates in our June meeting, and that's June 6th. So congratulations. 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 And moving on to personnel non instructional, if I could have a motion to approve PNI 1 to PNI 3, please. I'll motion. And a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any objections? Any abstentions? Motion carried 6 0. And that brings us to finance with Dr. Harris. Okay, just a couple of items tonight. I'm happy about that. Um, item A is obsolete equipment at Kegabine. Um, some of it is medical equipment that was specific for a student. And another item um, is one that has not been inspected uh, for several years and our other buildings are no longer using, as well as some obsolete tables. We also have um, for tonight obsolete bus award. So this is in the area of um, transportation. Uh, subject area C is the UPK contract uh, for St. Stephen's. This is a new item and this helps us to allocate the additional slots we received. So in total, we have, um, oh, that was a bad word. I was gonna say farmed out. Um, we have allocated all slots, um, available slots to different um, CBOs as well as the district. And we will be doing our lottery in the coming weeks. I actually think it may be in the next week or two. Okay. May 18th in this room. Um, so those are my three items for action. Okay, if I could have a motion to approve items A through C, please. And a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any objections? Any abstentions? Motion carried 6 0. Uh, subject area D is just the uh, normal extracurricular report uh, that is given quarterly. E is budget transfers under 15,000. Um, and F is on here, uh, even though it is online, we have made some changes to the budget book this year. Um, we've included um, some charts and graphs just to make it look a little bit more interactive um, and easy to read for uh, the community to do comparisons from one year to the next. Um, so as we move forward, we hope to do a lot more of that when it comes to finance, just incorporating those things so people can easily compare and understand um, what's happening. That is it. Thank you. Okay, so on to special education with Cheryl Cardone. Thank you, and I have two quick items too tonight. Um, special education of CPSE and CSE programming um, for our students. If I could have action on those, please. Okay, if we could have a motion for A and B, please. I'll motion. And a second. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Any objections? Any abstentions? Motion carried 6-0. Thank you. 
And that brings us to the superintendent's report with Dr. Grant. Good evening, everybody. Just uh, want to give the board an update on the uh, screening of the documentary film Like that we uh, conducted on May 4th for parents and interested members of our community. We had about 30 people in attendance. I want to thank Nicole for being there as well. Uh, and again, as you know, uh, besides uh, the screening, we had a, an amazing uh, group of high school student leaders who shared from their perspective to the parents that were in attendance some ideas, some tricks, uh, some tips on how to help kids have a healthy balance with social media. And they really did a fantastic job. Uh, additionally, uh, our students uh, from the high school supported the screening of the, of the film to our middle school students uh, the, the very next day. And they also supported our uh, students on Friday, May 6th, during their web day with uh, different activities uh, to help, again, further the conversation of a healthy balance uh, with um, social media. And as you can see, we're, we want to thank Kelsey Green and Morgan Kadra and Raven and Anna and Sophia and Madeline and Madison. Just kind of reading around your head, Mr. Laura. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And then Joseph as well. So uh, really wonderful students uh, working in tandem with Jessica Hutchings and Brody Kaiser and our high school and middle school administration in this Cardone. So really a great uh, a great program that not only was uh, looking at a film, but also listening to our, uh, their peers at the high school level. Uh, as the board may know, there was a pre-test and a post-test, or a pre-survey and a post-survey. Uh, the next slides uh, are our students um, responding to the post-survey. So you can see this slide says, I constantly check social media on my device you can see out of the 615 responses, 136 kids were in that category of level four, which was agree, and 102 students were in the category of strongly agree. So you can see that the students themselves, you know, uh, were indicating that they do constantly check social media on their device. Uh, this item here uh, looked at a change in the perception of middle school students from 31% to 41%, and the item was, I believe, that students should take a break from their cell phones for the entire school day. <coughs> so there was an increase after the film uh, where students said, yeah, you know, I agree that we should have a break at least from 31% to 41%. This item was after reviewing the film, I'm happy with my relationship with social media. And again, of the 615 respondents, we had 205 students agree, and 176 students uh, strongly agree uh, that they are happy uh, with their relationship. Interestingly, the perception, though, changed from 65% of the students in the pre-survey to 61 or 62% in the post-survey. Oops. This item is, after reviewing the film, I'm concerned with the amount of time I spend on my phone or social media each day. Uh, the change was from 12% to 17% after reviewing the film. This item was uh, measuring, after reviewing the film, uh, I believe social media can make some teens feel anxious and depressed. 58.4% uh, said they agreed with that statement uh, before the film, and it jumped to 64.5% uh, after the students watched the film. This item was after reviewing the film. I believe that bullying occurs on social media. 74% of our students uh, believe that bullying does occur um, in social media that they're a part of. And this was interesting. 24% of our students indicated that they have been bullied online, and 42% of the 615 students said that student 42% uh, have said that they've witnessed others being bullied um, when using social media. And as far as strategies go, uh, after reviewing the film, there were 48% uh, of our students who said that they would mute 
social media notifications. 16% uh, said that they would uh, start fact-checking their news feed. Uh, there was uh, almost 29% of the students who indicated that they would charge their phone outside of their bedroom. Uh, another 14% said that they would uh, begin scheduling times to check their social media. 25% uh, of the kids said that they might take a day off from social media. And 34% um, uh, of the students said, we're already, you know, we're already doing some of these strategies. And uh, you know, about 15% said that they would not consider any of those strategies. Any questions about that information? Very good, and then the rest of uh, our slides are just some of the great news that you heard today from our student ambassadors or our, uh, our other presenters tonight. These were our students who received the Academy of Finance National Honor Society uh, recognition and our high school uh, students of the month for April. And uh, our unified basketball team is off and running and here are some of our students getting ready to go to their first uh, competition, which was off campus. Let's see, there we go. It was Teacher Appreciation Week, so there was a lot of celebrating. We want to thank our administrators and parents who helped to support uh, and recognize our teachers throughout the, the last week. Uh, here's some other photos uh, taken by Larry Austin, uh, just throughout the week, some of the athletic events and classroom activities that our students are uh, a part of. And the teachers are running a Twitter account and they are constantly celebrating student spotlights uh, throughout Sidway, Kegabine, and Heath, and of course our middle school and high school. So I, that's all that I have for you today. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, that brings us to the Board of Education report. We have a GISBA liaison report uh, from Sue attached for each review. I'm guessing if Sue were here, she'd remind you to think about uh, getting your team ready for the July golf tournament. It's never too early to start thinking about that. And our other item is late bus and after school locations. I don't know if you want to kick that off, Nicole. I think that was your item there. do offer late buses um, at Youth and Kegabine. I think the, that late bus program ends in May. So was your question more about middle more school? About middle school, okay. middle school, and high school? So we do offer middle school transportation. The pickup time is 4 o'clock. I believe we have three buses, Mrs. four buses, Mrs. Lisa Day is saying, and that's also a 4 p.m. pickup for after school activities to get those kids shuttled home. So I think a lot of parents' question was, I don't know of any of the so yeah. a lot of them are started yeah. it's, it's not necessarily for for athletic events that start after school because they run pretty late uh, so maybe um, you know an event might end close to four if it starts right away at the end of the day like a practice you know say for middle school or high school but any athletic events uh, that are on campus okay. could could extend like a track meet, softball, baseball, even tennis today. Tennis today start till four. So it would be. Just asking about practices that they used to be, like the regular late bus we have now, and some of them used to have like a later one at like five o'clock. That may have been before I arrived as superintendent, but I'm going to look over to Teresa. She's shaking her head yes. Uh, there was uh, maybe two tiers of late buses, but. Uh, years ago, the board and uh, the administrators narrowed that down to one tier. Okay, so I just maybe look at if that could maybe be offered. 
like of two two tiers that probably can't because we just approved our budget and it would be a budgetary addition um, because you know if you can imagine every day having two tiers you know with four buses each would be you know an addition to the budget. Yeah. Teresa can you can add a couple more that I <coughs> want to talk about first. About the late buses? About why they went away? Well they were they were in conjunction with the three tier school bell system. So that was at the same time when there was three tiers for the school at the bell times. So there was also two um, late buses provided at the same time. So when it changed we adopted the four o'clock only and it's not necessarily for the athletics like Dr. Graham said, it was more for any after school activities which it still you know provides and as we dwindle down in May, it, it, the, like we said, um, Kegabine and, and Hugh will end middle of May and middle school and well, high school mm -hmm. their, their last days. But we continue to provide transportation um, that you know kids can use it for classes or um, you know, the, they, for the after school so at four o'clock all the way to the end of middle school. So, but the, the second one would determine a later uh, involvement for operation for transportation, everything that comes with that, um, we would have to extend it quite till six o'clock at night. Because um, it would be a five o'clock, you do a four and you do a five. So in that consideration, it would be, we would really have to review if that would be a possibility. But at four o'clock, it's been, uh, they're used well, but right now they're dwindling down as well. What about the after school locations? I know that's a topic on here as well. If something doesn't start till four o'clock and school is out at what time, 2.30 at the high school, 2.35, something like that. Um, is there a location that students can go to so that they don't have to go home and then come back at four o'clock? It's my understanding, I could be wrong, that if children are staying after school for an extracurricular club or activity, they're supervised by that person who's in charge of that until such time as they're getting on a bus or uh, getting picked up from, with, by their parents. Mr. Lorenz. Yeah. I mean, there's a variety of supervision options for kids, but sometimes it depends on the coach and it depends on when the coach ends because, you know, we do have some elementary teachers who then come up and coach, but we also keep our, our monitor on site until at least, I believe, 4 o'clock, who is in the Viking Mall area. So what typically happens is most of this, most of the teams start pretty early, pretty quickly after school ends, and then some of the teams kind of stagger that start time for practice, and some of them stick around in the monitor position does continue to supervise them here if they're not already going after school in the library or with a teacher. Um, so when we were at the high school in the past, we've, we've had some issues with the supervision aspect, but we've mm -hmm. really worked together to try to you know, do what was best and make sure at least they're supervised in that area. Yeah. I know at, at Lewiston Porter we have the same issue and we have uh, a monitor, we do have a monitor in the cafeteria and students are directed to go to the cafeteria if they're out of school at 2.35 and they have no one there till four o'clock. So for example, if they have an elementary teacher that's coaching a sport at the high school and so they don't get out of work till 3.45 at our elementary, um, and then at four o'clock the sport starts, they would wait they would wait downstairs in our cafeteria. I just wanted to know if there was anything like that here where students don't have to go home and then be brought back, because a lot of parents work, and then would have a hard time getting their child back at 4 o'clock for that activity. I, I will say we've tried a few things. Like There was a year where we did like a study table type thing where some of the athletes would go to room 110, which is that tiered room. Um, so we have tried some things over the years, but it, we've kind of looked at whether it was required and needed. It seems as if certain years are more troublesome for whatever reason than other years, and I'm not sure if you've had major issues this year with supervision, but um, I will say, like I said, at the end of the year, it does tend to dwindle down into very few numbers at this point, but it, it seems as if the winter season was always a big problem because people were staying indoors, and so yeah. we're trying different things, sometimes even in different seasons. I mean, if there were kids in the Viking Mall uh, between 2.30 and 4, and their practice started at 4 in the winter, would that be would that be an issue, or would they, you know, would it be problematic to have kids waiting, or is that what they should do? Should they just, I mean, I, 
I don't want to cause a, you know, an issue where uh, we have a large number of students and can't accommodate them, but I want to make sure that if parents are working and can't get the student back at 4 o'clock, it doesn't prevent them from doing a sport either because there are a lot of working parents that um, wouldn't be able to come here at 2.35 or have their child take the bus home rather at 2.35, get home at 3 o'clock, and then be home by 4 to get them back to school. And I don't want that to be, uh, you know, basically a, a factor in their um, non-participation because they don't have a ride back to the school. So, Mr. Lawyer, you mentioned that there's a hall monitor at the high school that works until 4. Yes. 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 And I, I, I don't want to speak for the current high school administration because they obviously probably learned a lot this year and there's like, you know, ideas flowing. I just want to share that there's things that we've tried. Um, I will say this. It's never an issue when the kids after school are doing the right thing and that they're, you know, they're, they're doing what they're supposed to, but it becomes an issue sometimes. And sometimes it's not even athletes or kids staying after. Sometimes kids just like to stay after school because they don't want to go home. Um, and so, you know, it, when there's issues, hopefully they're addressed and that those, are, those are handled, but for, we don't want to necessarily spoil it for the other kids either who are doing the right thing and they're looking for a quiet place to go to work. So, you know, it'll give you guys something to think about moving forward. It's interesting that we're having this conversation. It's a good time to have it because mm -hmm. it's a good time. Yeah, I was just brought to my attention that parent asked me because they said that their kid was told specifically last week that the whole team was told you can't stay after you have to go home. Can you share Shuffling the, us around. Can you share the team? Huh? Can you share the name? You know, the, what team it was? Yeah, okay. So they had a game that was I I'll just say like examples like basketball where we would have kids have a game at seven or eight. So no, we, we would expect them to go home and come back. Home, but I'm just right. Saying, but like, if they're going to go to practice at 4 or 4 30, are they allowed to stay here? Yeah, and I think it depends on. And I know Mr. Fitzpatrick might have a comment. I just want to clarify the modified cross when the coach notifies us that there isn't a way game or they can't make it until 4 p.m., we make every accommodation to have a monitor as last week we had a teacher stay for those girls. Okay. So there was a person. Okay. I'm just letting it so everyone knows that when we are notified, we make every accommodation okay. to keep the kids at school. Is that good? Yeah. Communication. Yeah, it looks like it's a communication piece. All right, great. I just uh, want to be sure that the, it was clear to parents that they could stay until the 4 o'clock practice just so it doesn't discourage kids from participating that you know may think well I can't do that because I don't have a ride back to school some and at certain times but does anyone have anything else on the bus or um, after school locations okay that brings us to the public comment session general items not included in this agenda we did not have anyone sign up for that and so now we are on committee of the whole items and information for the round table starting with Glenn um. Oh, the the cell version of inspiration happened since the last board meeting. Yes. So we didn't talk about it. We did already. We did. We did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, never we, mind. We didn't we didn't bring everybody here, but there were some pictures in my superintendent report about that. Okay. So yeah. you know, I just lose track of time. Yeah. Um, it was so really great. So, so, no, I was there. I was there. Yeah. 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 That's great. Right. And I thought that it happened since the last board meeting, but maybe it did not. Well, I got I understand what you're saying. I think I may. Have, you uh, talked about it before. Before. Right. Okay, so I went to celebration of inspiration, which happened since the last board meeting. And about 30 kids showed up, maybe more. Um, it was remarkable what they said about the teachers and other staff members and vice versa. There was an opportunity for both to say something about each other. And uh, it was just, you know, I've never done anything as inspiring as to anybody as they've done to each other. It was just great to see the, what they said. Um, and. Uh, Clearly, the the, uh, the, uh, the play over the weekend was very good. Everybody was in it. was great. So that's it. Thank you, Jay. Well, I, to piggyback on that celebration and inspiration, you walk out of there inspired, right? Like hearing all these stories, these inspiration stories about the teachers uh -huh. and the parents' students. So, great event for sure. Nicole. 
Except mm -hmm. if you have a chance and you didn't watch the like, video and they show it again, I suggest you go. Because Dr. Graham said I did go with my high school and she pointed out to me at one point in time in the Facebook section that that was me and I needed to monitor myself as well. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we both had a little learning experience. It was really nice. Hey, you. Danielle? Two quick things. Ruby mentioned the UPK lottery. I just want to invite anyone that's interested in being here for that UPK lottery. It is on March, sorry, May 18th at, I think, 1 p.m. right here in the high school in this room. So you're invited to that. And I also want to say I'm looking forward to celebrating all of the tenure recommendations tonight um, and retirees at our next board meeting. Sure. Thank you. Dr. Harris. Kudos to our transportation department and everything they are doing, but we need drivers. So if you know someone or you yourself are able to drive, uh, we are looking for people um, and the more the merrier. And also our budget vote is May 17th. So come, come one, come on. That's it. Yep. And just to dovetail into what Ruby just shared, we're having an elementary track meet here on that day, an art show, and the chicken barbecue. So it should be a great event. So hope to see you on Tuesday, May 17th. Okay, yes, uh, May 17th, annual budget vote and election, 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. And May 23rd is our joint meeting with the town of Grand Island at 7 p.m. at Town Hall. And I would just like to... Um, Thank all our teachers for everything they do for um, it's Teacher Appreciation Week, and we are very um, lucky to have some excellent educators at Grand Island. And um, with that, um, it is time 8:50. I'd like to ask for a motion to adjourn our regular board meeting. And a second. All in favor? Aye. Any objections? Any abstentions? Motion carried 6-0. Thank you. Good night, everyone.